Bene, allora benvenuti, eh, buonasera. Eh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce you uh, today's lecture uh, and to frame the recent work of Stan Allen. Um, of course, all of you know him, so uh, that's why you are here. Uh, this event is part of the lecture series The Future or uh, the Eclipse of Criticism. Uh, that I organize uh, here at the Maxi with the active support of the public office, um, uh, pu pu public program office at the Maxi Museum. Uh, this cycle of lecture is intended to uh, refocus on the theme of critique, uh, which has been almost entirely replaced today uh, by scientific analysis, a documentary interest for archives, narratives, and the use of new medias, performances, and exhibition, which are offered as new forms of criticism. Um, on uh, June 8, uh, Paolo Portoghesi will give the last lecture of this uh, series. Um, on the absence of a specialized architectural uh, criticism in media and newspaper. And as part of this program, in, um, in the past weeks, we had the pleasure to have uh, with us uh, the archaeologist and historian uh, Salvatore Settis, um, as well as the artist Francesco Vezzoli, uh, the curator Mirko Zardini, and the art, the art critic Nicola Burriot. Um, and now I'm really pleased to have finally uh, an architect here, um, or, or better, two architects, because um, they are um, uh, Stan Allen and Hilary Sample. Uh, they are um, both involved in uh, theory and practice uh, and pedagogy. Um, I would start introducing uh, Hilary, uh, which is here. City. Um, Hilary is an international recognized and award-winning architect. Um, she is the co-founder, together with Michael Meredith of Moss, um, a practice based in New York City. Um, monograph about their office, about the studio, uh, include an issue of El Croquis, um, together with the book uh, Selected Works, uh, PA Press. Um, um, by the way, tomorrow we will launch a book together, so you are all invited to, to come at Spazio Sette in, uh, in Rome. Hilary is the IDC Professor of Housing Design at Columbia University, and she recently published the book Maintenance Architecture, edited by MIT Press. Um, she made this uh, very interesting discussion on maintenance uh, intended as a skilled labor. Uh, which is needed if beauty is to endure. I really thank you, uh, Hilary Sample, for, uh, for what I learned about, uh, about her work and about her uh, dedication. Um, well, not long ago, um, the architecture critic Robert Somol uh, wrote, uh, uh, as an active critic and promoter of both his predecessor and contemporaries, it's quite possible that no one has a broader understanding of international design practices today than Stan Allen. And I really trust Bob Somol. Stan Allen is an architect and professor at the University of uh, Princeton School of Architecture, where he served as a dean for 10 years. Uh, in 1990, he established his independent practice, and since that time, he's pursued a parallel career as, a, as an educator, as, a, as an architect, and uh, as a writer. Uh, Stan Allen studied, as you know, with um, John Iduk, uh, graduated for, from Cooper in 1981, and uh, he worked with Richard Meyer and also with uh, Rafael Moneo in Madrid. As them, he had a very important role as an educator uh, for many generations of architects. Uh, Stan is the author of uh, important essays uh, like Field Condition that had many revised editions and was published on uh, um, his book Point Plus Lines, uh, Diagrams and Projects for the City. Um, another interesting essay, um, fundamental essay, is Practice versus Project, published on his book Practice, 
architecture technique and representation. His most recently, uh, his most recent book is a Situated Object, uh, published by Park Books, and it deals with a, a stand project located in New York, uh, Hudson River Valley. As you know, Stan is the author of uh, building uh, at the scale of the city, we can say, of landform buildings, uh, like the um, Book City in Korea, the Christ Church in Philippines, and uh, the Maribor Art Gallery. But after stepping down from the deanship at Princeton, he went back to the local, uh, to the Hudson River project, to the Hudson River buildings which reveal a kind of uh, domestic intimate scale. Uh, so a change, a kind of change in his work. Uh, um, this scale, this intimate scale was uh, something between the avant-garde and the vernacular, uh, between geometry and geography. This architecture show a rigorous interplay between um, his architectural language and the contest related constraints uh, between stability and accident. Uh, leaving space to the uncertainties of the real. Um, by the way, yesterday Stan made a very, a very interesting lecture in Pisa, uh, unpacking the ar archives by John Iduk, and explain um, through the buy house by John Iduk uh, the concept of situated object. Uh, with this expression, Stan recalls the minimalism vision of the artwork as a specific object. Um, and probably he also touched the, the, um, or recalls the Frampton concept of place form. Um, as we talked yesterday, uh, Rem Collas recently explained the concept of intermedistan, uh, the idea that the suburban space uh, is the same all over the world. Um, uh, Collas, of course, has a, a great, a great uh, um, make a great attempt to create a common ground, but Stan made something different. In fact, his work demonstrates um, that a project never starts from a tabula rasa, and any project follows a trajectory whose origin are given, uh, since any project has roots. Um, and is related to the history of a particular place. In fact, his built projects are situated into a critical um, study of North American um, frame construction from which he retrieves a kind of formal language that relies in ordinary uh, buildings material. Also on the iconic power of the roof line integrated by a working process ba based on simple rules that implied a serial attitude. But his buildings are situated and not just rooted, so they have the skill to belong uh, to a place but also to cross space and time. Uh, Stan wrote in his book that uh, uh, buildings do not uh, uh, end with their wall. They are the nexus for a complex uh, uh, field of social relations, cultural norms and local histories. Architecture and landscape work together to create a sense of place. He wrote, uh, architecture changed the world slowly and incrementally and works by definition locally and not global. Uh, I leave the floor to Stan Allen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lena, and, and welcome, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's, a, it's a nice opportunity for me to, um, to think about the work that I've done over these past years from a kind of different perspective. Um, this is not a lecture about libraries, although that would be one way to, to, to connect buildings to books. Uh, but I wanted to start with this, this canonical image by, by Boulet, uh, in part to call attention to the physicality of the book as an object. Because in the, in the Royal Library Project, it is the books that make the space, in a way. So, so um, when, when Lena invited me in the context of a lecture series devoted to criticism, uh, I'm a working architect, I'm not a critic. I don't necessarily have a lot to say about the state of architectural criticism today, other than it's pretty appalling. But um, um, I thought one way to talk about this and is to 
think about the way in which architects have always, parallel to the work of, of building and designing, have produced books, have worked in a kind of discursive field uh, through writing. I'm an architect who also writes. I don't write criticism necessarily, but I will write as a way to clarify my own, my own thinking. So um, it became a kind of nice opportunity for me to, to think about the role that books have played in, in my practice. And, and really, Hillary is a kind of ideal respondent because um, their practice has also really been characterized by a kind of continual uh, production of books parallel to, to buildings. Um, so uh, books, of course, have been part of the practice of architecture uh, for many, many years. I mean, we can go from Alberti to, to Kohlhaus in this particular case by way of Marinetti, but that wouldn't necessarily be the only way to go. Um, that this continual production, whether it's treatises, manifestos, monographs, of the production of books and writings drawings and diagrams parallel to the process of making buildings. Um, in fact, Mario Carpo, in, in his first book, um, Architecture in the Age of Printing, marks the beginning of the modern uh, practice of architecture with the emergence of the printed treatise uh, in the 16th century. So uh, the idea that the, 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 what had previously been oral traditions tied up with a kind of collective uh, guild system become consolidated and codified in printed architectural uh, treatises. Uh, and incidentally, um, the idea that uh, architectural design is mediated, mediated through other codes, such as drawings and diagrams, is what uh, allows him to refer to Alberti as the first digital architect because of the way in which he used um, alphanumeric uh, diagrams. Now, of course, famously in the 19th century, uh, Victor Hugo, um, writing about that same transition, gives it completely the opposite uh, valuation. Uh, he has his character say, this will kill that. The book will destroy the edifice. What he meant by that, and, and it's Victor Hugo speaking through his character, is that the collectively understood book of stone that was the Gothic cathedral um, will be destroyed by the culture of printed books. Uh, printed books that will only be the book of stone that could be read by all the inhabitants of Paris uh, in a sh through a shared collective language will now only be available to an, a, a, a literate elite, those who, can, those who know how to read and those who can afford to buy books. Uh, and books were expensive. Uh, when we look at the 20th century, a canonical figure like, like Le Carusier, again, throughout his practice, there's a parallel production of books, and you mark the sort of stages of his practice by the different books published dur during the, that period of time, including the, the, the obsessively ordered production of his own work in the oeuf complet. And this continues today. We could think, we could trace the history of 20th century architecture as much through uh, publications as through particular buildings or drawings. So um, Venturi's complexity and contradiction often understood to be a kind of uh, answer to Vers une architecture, uh, published the same year as Rossi's Architecture of the City. And then for a younger generation of architects, younger than, than Le Carissier, old older generation today, uh, this has just, just continued, Schumi, Kohlhaus, and, 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 and Ungers. The other thing that's important here with this, these two examples, the Schumi and the Kohlhaus books both came out before Schumi or Kohlhaus had, had, had a working architectural practice. Uh, so books were, for them, a strategy to establish a presence in the field uh, through the Manhattan transcripts or Delirious New York, Kohlhaus's retroactive manifesto, uh, that established a, a, a presence in the field before they, they actually had presence as, as uh, building architects. Now, apparently the obvious counterexample to this is Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe famously said, build, don't talk. Uh, but some 20 years ago, the historian Fritz Neumeyer did a deep dive into the libraries of Mies van der Rohe and he shows very, very convincingly in his book, The Artless Word, that 
Mies was very much uh, invested in the written word, in philosophy, and, and ideas as expressed in, in, in books. Um, now, originally, uh, the respondent to this lecture was meant to be Joseph Bedford, who was instrumental in um, uh, my becoming a part of this project. This is a book that was published um, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe, uh, uh, taking its title from the Walter Benjamin essay, Unpacking My Library. Um, they approached 10, 10 or so architects and um, um, asked them, among other things, to pick out 10 books that were influential for them. Um, um, Harry Cobb was still alive at the time, it was uh, Bernard Schumi, Peter Eisenman. Um, so um, I pulled this book out in preparing for this lecture. Um, these were the books I picked out, Banham, that's Gregory Bateson, it's hard to read from here, uh, Robin Evans, Dave Hickey, uh, the, the art critic, um, uh, J.B. Jackson, the, the, the landscape essays of J.B. Jackson. Funny little book by Jane Jacobs that uh, was actually recommended to me by, by Dave Hickey, of all people. That's an odd pair, Dave Hickey and Jane Jacobs. Um, two novels, um, Sechu Matsumoto's Points and Lines, which is a, a piece of Japanese noir published in the um, uh, 1960s. I, I didn't know about this book until after I published Points and Lines. Um, Gravity's Rainbow, interestingly enough, was a novel that appeared on a number of different architects' lists. Um, somehow Thomas Pynchon and architects sort of go together. Um, and the, the book that appeared on more of the lists than any other books was Complexity and Contradiction. Although they got the wrong issue, that it should be the, the funny little, little one from the modern. And then they sort of scanned everyone's shelves. So this is, this is a very random sampling of the shelves in my office at the time. Um, and you know, one of the things about the book as a physical artifact is that it allows for these sort of random juxtapositions. You know, so so in fact, there is the the, the Fritz Neumeyer book next to the Light Construction Reader, next to Le Carrier. Um, there's there's the proper version of the um, complexity and contradiction between Mies and um, and 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 Kohlhaas somehow. Um, so uh, this was, it's kind of, was a kind of interesting peek into the libraries of these, these architects. And uh, you know, what it says, I think, from the point of view of my work is that I, I work surrounded by books. Uh, I, I have to have my books there. I pull them off constantly during the process of working. Now, another thing, and this was very important to me when I was the dean at Princeton, um, the economics of publishing are such these days that you really need the support of institutions. So um, I developed a, a program of publications, this is just a few of the things we published, that included um, books that documented uh, the studios taught by visiting critics like David Adjaye and Mencia Tunyon. Um, and uh, these books documented uh, a, an endowed lecture we have called the Kassler Lecture. Um, the first Kassler lecture was delivered by Buckminster Fuller in 1966. We found a onion skin typescript, um, which had been um, um, recorded by a, a court stenographer with one of those funny, funny machines, still preserved. Um, and then the Ito book by, by uh, Happy Accident came out the year that Ito won the, the, the Pritzker. And I mentioned before, I mean, the ideal respondent for this discussion is, is Hilary Sample. This is a, a, a rather small selection of the, of the many books that their office has uh, produced. Um, so I look forward to that discussion with, with uh, Hillary. Um, this is the first book I published. It's not really a book. It's more of a pamphlet. It was um, for an exhibition I did at Columbia University, I don't know, early 90s maybe. Um, and at that time, my practice consisted of mostly doing art galleries in Lower Manhattan. So I was working in interiors and I was working in um, competition projects at the urban scale. So interiors and the urban scale leaving out the object scale, leaving out the building scale, interestingly enough. Um, and Lena mentioned uh, the publication Points and Lines, 1999 this book came out. Um, and uh, the, the most uh, recognizable piece in that is this essay, Field Conditions, 
Um, and that, that's the uh, Danish version of, of the essay. Um, now, um, Points and Lines, the book Points and Lines was a book of essays and projects. So again, it sort of lays out a practice agenda, if you will, both by examples of projects and by um, uh, written statements. And in fact, was divided into these three categories, contextual tactics, infrastructural urbanism, and uh, field conditions. Um, and the graphic component of these books is always very, very important. So the diagrams, the photographs, and the references. Now, inter now Lena also mentioned this book and this essay. It was, she didn't know I was going to show it necessarily. So, um, uh, and again, I think it's significant at the same time as Points and Lines was published, I published a book of, uh, of collected essays. I, I, I liked the idea of um, publishing book of essays under the title Practice. And in so doing, I wanted to underscore the idea, again, not a kind of abstract relationship between theory and practice, but really a kind of dialogue between two parallel practices, a practice of writing and a practice of designing and building. OK, uh, I'm going to stand up, actually, so I don't have to keep doing this so much. Um, this is a kind of road map of the, of the, of the talk tonight, um, which you could think of as a kind of history of my practice through three books. So uh, beginning with Field Conditions and, and the Points and Lines book, um, I'm going to show um, some work from the book Land, Landform Building, initially a conference in 2008 and then published as a book in, in 2010. And then again, Situated Objects was published in 2020, but the work began in uh, 2018. So, um, now, curiously enough, when I did the, when I wrote the field conditions essay, I didn't mention landscape at all, even though you would think that would be an obvious uh, connection. Um, and it was really through a brief partnership with the landscape architect James Corner that I started thinking much more about questions of landscape and thinking of the city as a kind of expansive uh, field condition. So the, 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 the sort of founding premise of landscape urbanism is that this image of the rural landscape and this image of the urban landscape actually share a lot in common. Uh, there, are, there are movements and forces and uh, uh, patterns evident in both of those uh, that are more, that have more in common than they are different. The other interesting, um, uh, um, uh, comment is that um, landscape urbanism was first articulated through conferences and projects and books. There were books about landscape urbanism before there were any realized projects in landscape urbanism. So again, that's a different relationship between the project and the, and the book. Now, the Landform Building uh, began as a conference at Princeton University. You can read who was involved in that original conference, and then most of those people, uh, in turn, contributed to, to the book. Landform Building was a kind of curatorial project that I did. Um, and in some ways, it was a response to the work in landscape urbanism, an attempt to sort of recover the agency of the architect and the agency of the building in the urban context, while at the same time learning the lessons that had been learned from uh, land. Uh, landscape urbanism. And also simply kind of responding to the proliferation of buildings such as this, Eisman's uh, Santiago project, buildings that aspire to the condition of landscape. Um, so Richard Rogers, I believe, on the left there, Toyo Ito. I don't think you're actually meant to walk on that Ito roof, but it's, I mean, you would certainly want to walk on that Ito roof because, again, it's a building that, that aspires to the condition of, of, of surface and landscape. But again, I want to reiterate that this is part of the deep history of, of the field, from uh, Bruegel and the Tower of Babel um, to the Magic Mountain at, at Walt Disney, the construction of a kind of artificial mountain as a kind of architectural uh, project. This is a project by Ahmed Z uh, Zero Nueve. Um, this was, I believe, a skin for a power plant competition that they, they did. Um, so landform building was an attempt to establish a series of working categories to think about this uh, landscape, landscape working at the scale of the building, at the scale of the city. 
those four categories, form, scale, process, and atmosphere. Uh, so the, the form category worked out of this notion of, a, of the artificial mountain. Um, the idea of foregrounding architecture's uh, geological character, mineral character, as opposed to its biological character. Um, so projects by Nemencia Tunyon, um, the library in Medellin by, by uh, uh, Giancarlo Mazzanti. Um, and then for each of these categories, we um, had a, a, a project by, a related project by an artist, Tassida Dean, a uh, beautiful series of found images of ice that she had collected. She writes on a very hot summer day in the flea markets of, uh, of Berlin, found photographs of, of, of ice. Um, so the, the, the scale took its title from Kenneth Frampton's uh, essay, Megaform, Megaform in the Urban Landscape. Um, and again, the, 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 the architecture operating at a very, very large scale in a kind of dialogue with the landscape. And here we did take the liberty of publishing one of our projects, competition project for uh, a, a, a landscape site in Korea. We consolidated all of the hard programs into a single built strip that ran the entire length of the given site um, and would uh, leave the rest of the site actually untouched um, and developed as, as landscape. Um, we didn't win. Um, it was won by a landscape architect with a very conventional scheme. It was, you know, again, in a way, our, our scheme was, uh, we were the only architects invited, actually, and it was, it was a kind of anti-landscape. <laughs> uh, 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 so it's not surprising we didn't win, maybe. Um, this, this was the uh, art component of, of that section. Um, and then I wanted to look at what are actually the technical constraints of building these curvilinear surfaces, these surfaces that function like uh, landscapes? How, you know, what, how, do you, how do you make terrain? Um, and uh, this was a, a contribution by, by the engineer Fabian Shira, uh, who um, was the consultant for the PSANA EF, uh, EPFL in Lausanne. Um, and you know, it was really quite interesting to see how much engineering actually is required to create those smooth landscape-like uh, surfaces. And then this is an interesting category, the, the, the atmosphere, uh, the, the, the large interiors. I've always been fascinated by interiors that are so large that they take on the character of an, of an exterior of a public space. So this famous example, uh, Villanova Artigas' uh, Faculty of Architecture in Sao Paulo, um, and uh, of course famously here shown uh, during mass demonstrations against di dictatorship. So, so the, 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 the interior space of the building becomes like a kind of public uh, uh, piazza. Um, but you, know, you could also see that in terms of an architect like, um, like John Portman in the United States. Um, and a number of our architects that interested me that are working with this more sort of immersive character of, uh, of architecture. This is an unbuilt project by Sana for uh, Museum in Valencia. Um, and, and of course, uh, their, their, their disciple, I guess you could say, uh, Junji Ishigami, uh, with his Kate Technology Center, with this sort of field of columns, again, creating a kind of immersive, um, uh, non-directional sense of, of interior. So uh, an architectural interior that you would experience like a landscape, like walking through the forest in a way. Uh, and a beautiful series of photographs by the Swiss um, archi artist uh, Walter Niedermeyer. Um, so just to, just to orient you here again, there was this interesting moment of sort of folding back and revisiting the field conditions, uh, and we made a book. Um, so um, at this point, 15 years had elapsed since the initial field uh, conditions piece, and uh, I had found in certain projects I was doing at the time, in particular the, the competition for the Maribor Gallery, that the part to whole strategies of aggregation that were characteristic of field conditions now sort of rethought in relationship to a more iconic uh, profile of the, of the individual units uh, themselves. Um, that, was, that was published in a book um, by uh, Ohio State University. Um, where you begin to see the relationship between uh, the Marabor project and this sort of array of study models for the smaller scale projects that Lena, Lena mentioned. So, 
So this is that moment um, when I finished with the deanship at Princeton, relocated my office to the Hudson River Valley, and refocused my work on a kind of smaller scale uh, uh, design projects um, that have in some sense their origin in the earlier uh, Psychoponic House. And I just want to point out that this piece of the M&M studio is in fact one of the uh, one of the units of the of the Maribor project uh, actually realized as a as a um, uh, as a uh, studio for an artist and again that that notion that there's a kind of specificity to the individual forms that can be aggregated to create a collective or they can stand on their own um, for for an individual so that that is the work that is uh, collected in the book situated objects um, started to work in um, 2018 book came out in 2012 middle of the pandemic um, that looks at series of projects that have a high degree of specificity as an individual object, always compact objects that have a certain degree of complexity, iconic roof lines, and even, again, a kind of crystalline uh, geological uh, um, uh, geometry, but always now placed in a very deliberate relationship to uh, landscape. Now, I think it's also important in this context to talk about the structure of the book, the kind of thinking that goes into the book, working with graphic designers. Um, and with situated objects, there were, there were two rules. Um, the first came from the photographer, Scott Benedict. Scott, all, of the, all of the projects documented in situated objects are shot by the same photographer, someone I've been working with for seven or eight years now. He shoots exclusively in black and white. Um, he doesn't shoot, you know, sort of conventional, again, uh, photographs of the of the architecture that 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 isolates the, the the building as an object, but always shooting it in relationship to the larger larger landscape. Um, so it was going to be a black and white book, and uh, all of the drawings are black and white line drawings. So those were the rules of the book, uh, and uh, we worked with a very talented graphic designer, uh, Luis Vasallo. Um, and you know, wonderful support from the people at 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 uh, at, at Park Park Books. So um, now again, I I'm kind of anxious to move on to the discussion with Hillary. I don't want to walk you through the entire Situated Objects book. I just want to give you a sense of the sort of structure of the book. Um, I'm, I'm going to go very quickly through the rest of the slides. Think of this as like flipping pages of the book. So. So uh, apologies if I go too, too quickly. Um, the book is structured in three parts. A friend of mine once told me that he thought I was hardwired to think in threes. Uh, points and lines had three sections. This book has three sections. Um, and the first of those is this idea of outbuildings, kind of American concept of the vernacular construction where over time many, many structures are built on a, on a site. And the first of these is this project, the MM Studio in uh, Cold Spring, New York. By the way, I added <laughs> line, black and white line drawings don't, um, don't, don't live very well with PowerPoints. So for the purpose of lectures, I've added color. But I think that's another thing about drawings, actually. You know, you, you'll go back to drawings. You rework them, you know, particularly now with the, with the uh, capacities of the, of the digital. So, for, for clarity and, and, and also just to have a kind of another life, there's, there's color added to these drawings. So, so this is a house and studio for, a, for an artist uh, living in New York and spending you know, a fair amount of her time uh, in the Hudson River Valley. Um, and it's a rather unique uh, opportunity for me, um, uh, this idea of the outbuilding, that another characteristic of the projects in Situated Objects is they, they always are in relationship to other, to existing structures or existing features of the landscape. So uh, this was actually the first house I ever built, um, finished around 2000. And uh, about 12 years later, around 2012, they came back to me. Um, they, wanted, they had decided that, that um, they wanted a studio on the property. And so it's a, it's a great opportunity for an architect to um, you know, go back and fix all the mistakes you made first time around. Um, so this is, the, this is the final project. And I think one of the things you'll notice is that there's a much more conscious integration of the building into the landscape in the second version of the project. So 
here's the studio and the, and the entry. Another thing, um, Situated Objects is a building full of, as a, sorry, it's a book full of plans. The assumption is it's a book um, uh, which is intended for a kind of uh, informed readership who will know how to read plans and will be interested in reading plans. Um, oh, again, the, the fo Be Scott Benedict's photographs and the way in which it's always uh, situated relative to landscape. Now, this project is also, interestingly enough, another return client. Um, I built that house on the right, right around the same time as the, as the MM house. Um, the client bought a, a piece of land in um, the Blue Ridge Mountains, not, not quite as picturesque. Well, that's a, that's a little bit distant from her site, but similar, um, with an existing rather banal kind of ranch house on the site. And our project is for the studio. Uh, and again, you see this idea that even within the single form of the studio, there are, there are two uh, elements, and they are, they are merged in a very kind of conscious way and in a kind of uh, frame to integrate into the landscape. So you see that here, still under construction. Uh, the materiality is concrete board, reinforced concrete, and then galvalume siding. So there's a kind of, there's a kind of similar coloring and different tonality and texture to the different materials used here. Uh, worked with the landscape architect Greg Bleem for this project. Um, and another example of the way in which Scott's photographs are always showing the building not as an object but in relationship to landscape. This is actually the complex of buildings where I um, live and work upstate. Um, existing barn, existing house, the studio. Uh, and the studio was actually the, the first of these sort of consciously working through this design methodology. Um, with the, the roof geometries and the kind of diagrammatic approach, very compact but um, um, faceted geometries with a kind of identifiable uh, roof form in, in, in reference to the simple vernacular of the pitched roof. Um, now, the second of these um, three categories um, is material histories. Um, and in particular, um, the idea of the bo balloon frame construction, which is still, a, the balloon frame was invented in Chicago in 1840 uh, and in modified form is still standard form of construction for, for small scale uh, building in the United States. So, so now for this particular project, hard, again hard to read, but um, I wanted to see the, project, see the building in relationship to a different landscape for the Chicago Biennial. So it was the landscape of the Midwest um, and made very specific reference to the, the, the uh, technologies of balloon frame construction. Now, uh, balloon frame construction uh, is, you can understand it in terms of its architectural implications, but it was also fundamental, for example, in the, ex the, the Western expansion uh, in the United States. Um, balloon frame houses could be built by untrained carpenters. They could be put on a railroad train and brought out and built in the plains in the, in the Midwest. Um, but also the demand for lumber because of all of that building ended up devastating all the forests of, of Wisconsin and Michigan. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an example in which a particular building technology can be understood in terms of a kind of larger network of forces, which are social forces, economic forces, and, and ecological forces. So that, I would say, is too, is part of the situated objects idea, that the building itself is a, a, a point in a much larger network of uh, forces. So now, uh, Lena mentioned the, the kind of seriality of the way that I work. So, it, there's a seriality to the design process, uh, different iterations of models. Um, but for the Chicago project, we wanted to see how those uh, elements could array to create a, a kind of collective uh, um, project. So this was the, sh this was the project for a, a school that was shown in the, in the Chicago bi Biennial. And again, using different techniques of drawing, um, sectioning axonometrics from below in this case um, to uh, kind of unpack the architecture and, and, and explain uh, to, to the viewer uh, the different um, uh, elements of that, of that architecture. 
Um, this was also an exhibition, actually same time, 2017, New Jersey Institute of Techn uh, no, sorry, uh, New York Institute of Technology. And again, we started from this very simple, recognizable house form. We multiply, we shift the geometries, we trim, we, we, we create a kind of object which has a certain degree of multiplicity and singularity at the same time. Uh, originally shown in the gallery and then uh, reconstructed uh, in a field up in upstate New York where it literally becomes an object in a field. Now the third of these categories uh, is this idea of new natures. Uh, and here really sort of returning to that notion of the atmospheric, the immersive character of landscape as it plays out in contemporary architecture. So this is a very well-known image. This is um, Mies van der Rohe's photomontage for the Reeser House, uh, unbuilt. It, it was to be uh, out in Wyoming. And famously what he has done is collaged the view of the Tetons uh, in a sense, sort of turning the house into a kind of viewing instrument for, for the landscape. So you could say he's establishing a relationship to landscape, but it's a relationship to landscape which is purely pictorial in a way. You, you could almost say that the, the three-dimensional character of landscape, the experiential character of landscape, becomes reduced to a two-dimensional image, that the, the, the plate glass windows essentially become a kind of, kind of screen. But the experience of landscape is an immersive experience. You don't, you don't look at a landscape so much as you inhabit a landscape. This is a work, and it's a video, and so it's, you're not fully getting the experience, but it's a, it's a work by a Los Angeles artist called Jennifer Steinkamp. It's called Blind Eye. This version was installed at the um, 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 Clark Art Institute. Um, all of the trees are digitally modeled. And when you, when you view this, there's movement, the leaves are rustling in the wind, the trunks are moving. You, you move around it and you really do feel like you're part of a kind of immersive experience. So that same immersive sense of, of um, landscape that I mentioned with the sauna, with the Ishigami, I think you, you, you're getting in the, um, in the Jennifer Stein camp. And we, we had this in mind, um, 2019 this was, we were invited by Barry Bergdahl to participate in an exhibition on the grounds of the uh, landscape painter Frederick Church, very important member of the Hudson River School of Painting, uh, constructed this um, uh, house and developed these grounds overlooking the Hudson River. So uh, Barry invited six architects to reflect on the relationship between architecture, landscape, and ecology in the 21st century and how it would be different from Church's approach, which, which was obviously, as a landscape painter, uh, uh, very much pictorial. I mean, actually, I, I shouldn't necessarily say that because um, it, in, it, it, Church actually thought of the, the, the entire site itself as, as a work of his. And, and he was the landscape architect, essentially, of this and very consciously sort of constructed that, uh, that landscape. So um, this was the model that was shown in the exhibition. And we proposed uh, a building which would be sited not like the church building on the top of the hill, sort of reigning over and capturing all of the views, but situated in relationship to what had been a working farm and orchard originally on site. Um, and in the development of the building itself, so, so here, you know, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed by this geometry of orchards, by the way. So the, so the building would be understood in relationship to a kind of productive uh, working landscape as opposed to a more sort of pictorial uh, landscape. And then in the building itself, we wanted to capture some of that sense of the sort of immersive character of, of landscape. So um, this space with the, 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 the curved walls like a photographer's scrim, uh, you know, space is mostly defined by corners. So you erase the corner and you create a kind of expansive interior space. All of the light coming from above um, and it was just, it was a small building to accommodate two visiting artists. So again, we would restore to what is now essentially a tourist site, a kind of presence of working artists. That's a geometry of the trusses um, and a view of the interior. So last project um, from the book that I'm going to show um, is another addition. Um, it's an addition to this rather bizarre house, um, which was, um, designed by an architect named Richard McElhaney, 
um, for an artist named Stephen Vanier. Um, you know, funny kind of amalgam, a little Rossi, a little Haydick, um, really rather bizarre uh, house, which, which my clients had bought and asked me to do an addition. Um, these are a couple of the original drawings. You can see how sort of quirky the, the, the house is. Then it was actually built by the artist himself and built, I have to say, actually very badly, <laughs> which became a, a kind of issue uh, when we were adding on to it. So given how weird and interesting and quirky the original house was, um, we, we decided to make a very, very neutral addition. Um, so uh, we, we uh, wanted to create a kind of large, uh, single open space on the ground floor like this. Um, as I said, some rather complex engineering uh, issues. You, 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 you see these columns just hanging in the air. I mean, it's really again, very bizarre construction we, we found when we opened this, this thing up. Uh, and then marking the new addition with a different material creating a kind of continuous open space at the ground floor. And then uh, we, 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 we took a, we a two-bedroom house, doubled the size, and turned it into a one-bedroom house, um, basically taking what had been um, uh, bedrooms and turning them into a gallery. The clients are art collectors, so they, they empty now, of course, but they will, they will show uh, their, their ha are showing their collection now in this uh, space. Um, that's the, the, the original, the addition, and then th this was our pandemic project. The, there was a little uh, kind of Sears Roebuck kit house on site that um, we renovated for them during the pandemic uh, when they were really up there more, more, more full time. So the last project I'm going to show is really work in progress. Um, and it was not uh, included in the Situated Objects book, but I think it makes sense to talk about in this context because it's a way in which the ideas articulated in the Situated Objects book get played out in what is for us our, our first institutional uh, commission. Um, we were asked by Bard College to provide a building for their uh, undergraduate architecture program, about 50 students. Um, the program is relatively new. It's not a professional program in architecture, but it's students studying architecture in the context of a liberal arts uh, program. And the site given to us is this one. Uh, whoops, sorry, that's a, what did I do here? Um, that's a Raphael Vignoli building here. Um, we're sort of at the edge of campus. And it's actually a very nice site because it's, it's uh, on, a, on a low hill, it's very densely wooded, looks out onto wetlands, uh, really, really quite fortunate to work on this site. So that's, that's the proposal and you can, you can see the topography. This is a big um, uh, like maintenance barn that, that, that's part of one of the things we're relating to there. But again, like the Situated Objects book, um, we were required to work with this existing house, which is on site, which is actually a modular house. It's honestly pretty crappy. Um, but uh, again, we, we sort of welcomed that opportunity uh, because it, it, it established this kind of dialogue with something that's already existing on, on site. Uh, it will get reskinned and you know, change the windows and details, but uh, the, the, the volume will essentially remain. It's, it's currently being used to house the program, as you can see, in a fairly kind of haphazard uh, way. Um, just a screenshot from Zoom. As, um, this, was, this, was a, this was a great little coincidence. Uh, um, what's being discussed in this seminar here is one of John Haydick's masks. So when I first noticed that on the image, it was kind of brilliant that there's a, there's a little John Haydick project in this, in this uh, image. So here's our proposal. Um, there's the existing house, uh, you know, re-roofed, re-skinned to uh, be more uh, consistent with, with the new proposals. And the idea that by breaking down um, the, the new, new components of the program into elements that are roughly the scale of a house, um, the scale of the new building will not overwhelm this existing uh, house on site. Um, we're adding about... Um, uh, 8,000 square feet, it's a small, small project. So um, here you can see the kind of design logic. Here's the existing house, the three uh, primary uh, making spaces, studio and fabrication. 
uh, and then offices and so on. Everything organized around a kind of open space at the center of the project, which will also uh, bring the, the, that relationship to the existing house into play, a little library piece that that's, uh, helps to, helps to, to bring uh, that uh, existing house more into the kind of language of the, of the project. So there you see a, a view during the summer when the trees are leafed out, and it really is, uh, you know, beautiful mature trees. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice, nice site. We're really looking forward to, to working in this, this context. Here's the plan. Um, the existing building is here. The library, you enter this way. Um, there's a bridge here uh, connecting the two. With a, with, a, with a view uh, in the distance. And then the, the, the primary teaching spaces, studio, studio, and a fabrication lab are here. Uh, so hopefully all the work spills out into the courtyard, really activates that space. But also because it's on the periphery of campus, uh, it's a space that's open to everybody and will, and will bring uh, students from the rest of the campus to the, to the architecture school building. So here's that entry piece as you're coming up where you, you're able to look uh, directly into the view across down to the, the wetlands below. Axonometric from below, again, using same, the same uh, drawing techniques from the Situated Objects book with studio, studio fabrication, and the idea that all of that activity will, will activate the, the courtyard uh, between the, the two buildings. So you see it there and there. So this is the space I work in. Um, you see the computer, you see some, some models, you see printouts on the, on the uh, wall. Um, but as I said, I work surrounded by books. Uh, so thank you very much. Good evening. Can everyone hear me OK? OK, just raise your hand if you can't as I'm talking. I tend to trail off. Well, thank you so much, Lena, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here at the Maxi. Um, I apologize, my, I don't, my Italian's not very good, so I have to speak in English. I'll try to speak a little slow for the translation. Um, I've been living here in Rome since February um, at the American Academy uh, with Michael Meredith, my partner. So, and I'm just really delighted, and thank you, Stan, for having me here. It was a wonderful talk. Um, great to see the work, as always. Um, I, have known you for 20 years, actually, <laughs> I realize. Uh, and, um, you know, follow, follow what you do, of course, and uh, try, to, try to keep up. Uh, there's a lot here and a lot uh, presented. Um, and so I think, you know, you were, you know, we talked a little before meeting. Um, and so really to talk a little bit about um, the idea of books and architects working on books, um, and you know, I think we can. I, I would like to ask you some some questions about that as a as a practice, uh, but as a um, you know, as a way of also approaching architecture um, through architecture itself, but also through the idea of making the book or a book or a series of books, um, because it's also a practice of writing. It's a practice, as you said already uh, previously, of curation in the way that you spoke about landform. Um, for me, that's also about a kind of practice of archiving. Um, and so maybe we could talk a little bit about that at some point. But maybe just to start more directly, because you, you showed us and you presented you know, the kind of first image um, of buildings and books with, with Boulay and the library, and then ending here with your own studio, which I have to say I've had privilege to visit and you know was struck by even coming up to the kind of second floor space I had to navigate on the stairs stacks of books and um, you know books on on various artists and I won't I won't give away you know maybe your your secrets but um, you know that that kind of made me think of course of um, Van Venturi house um, that the stair is more than a stair it collects other things other experiences, um, and in this case, you know that is obviously a house and it's domestic, but this is a studio. Um, but that you're also not, let's say, as we look at this image, you're not um, surrounded by books in a way that is um, something like the the unpacking your library really displayed, which is a wall of books, or 
Um, and so it's a landscape in a way. Um, and there's also these stacks, um, which reminds me of um, Yves Lombard and his studio, um, which is, yeah, right. And, and you know, that, that when in designing that and the kind of counter, right, is this, this empty open space ready to receive things. And in that way, he's working on Ellsworth Kelly, but it's stacking books and, and returning and having a kind of physical uh, working relationship to those books and, and the contents. And I, I think in this case, you're, kind, you know, you're doing similar things, but it's a, it's a different process. It's not something every architect does. Um, well, well, a lot of architects have the wall of books. You're doing something else, which I think is really important. Um, and shapes the work, so I, maybe... Well, there's a roll of books downstairs <laughs> in the studio. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, God, I mean, I, I, I should have thought of that. I, <laughs> one of, for people who don't know, one of the first projects that, that, that Michael and Hillary did, in fact, was a library for the yeah. art historian, Eva Lambois, and I will confess that those counters are actually probably cribbed from that project, maybe unconsciously, but no. um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's actually, you know, it's uncanny. I think, I think that project must have been in the back of my mind. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the MOS project, it was in an existing building, yeah. correct? Yeah. Downstairs, it's, it is really a library with, with right. book stacks and it's dense and it's, it's packed. And you go upstairs, and it's it's like this. It's very open, and and you have counters on all all yeah. sides. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's the same thing of being able to pull out a book, lay it out on the counter, and have it there for for, for reference. I you know I had I hadn't thought of that for probably many years, but it's it's kind of uncanny, and I I suspect it might have been in the back of my mind uh, when when I did this project. So, I mean, my my sort of sense here was. Um, you know, I wanted to feel like I was like up in the loft of a barn or something. That's, that's part of the reason why the walls come down so low. Um, but, but you know, it's funny, I hadn't yeah. thought of that until you mentioned it. It's, it's kind of uncanny. Yeah. And another, yeah. another reason for the, yeah. the, 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 the kind of um, uh, closeness there. Right. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, for sure. You should look at this project, very oh, early Moss you. project. It's, it's, it's in the, it's in the books you. and online. Right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, thank yeah. you. I mean, yeah. I, I think for me, it's just still also too thinking about, you know, the complexity and contradiction and thinking about just the way that Venturi is describing Vanna Ventura House and that stair. Mm -hmm. um, and the, but the stair is also the space of, um, of conversation and an exchange. And, but in your case, I think in the studio, it's a very, um, it's, it's more private. It's, it's a kind of scaled down. It's, it's your own way of sort of working and spreading out in the space. And I, you know, I, I would say that just also as a, in a kind of American context, right, a lot of our practices are, are so um, commercial of a particular scale. There's not this ability to work so directly with a book um, in this way. And both looking at books, working with books, opening them up, having space, um, and thinking about what the book does and, and who it's for. Um, I think that your, you know, the, the way that the practice, as you said, is parallel, um, to me also expands on, on the work and then the situated object because it's also about um, how you live and work with models and things that are more three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And there's, um, you know, it's a very fluid and, it, and back and forth, at least in my view, and I think that's very positive, as opposed to things that are um, often, models are made after the design is done, or, you know, that where is design happening um, in all of these things right. for you? It feels to me it's, it's continual. Sure, and I mean, I think, well, for one, one thing, um, the displaying books on the stair was certainly not intended. I mean, again, you know, these are the sort of happy accidents when, when yeah. something is actually built that you, you know, you find a kind of opportunity to use the space in ways that you may, may not have uh, uh, expected initially. But I think for me it's connected to this sort of larger idea of understanding architecture, the, the, the practice of architecture as, as a kind of a conversation with the past, a kind of ongoing conversation with the past. Yeah. And, 
you know, I mean, look, we, we, we can get into this question, but, you know, I, I am still a believer in the printed book and the physicality of the book. Um, and, and, you know, again, as I mentioned, the kind of happy accidents that happen with the physical book, um, you know, when you, you open a page at random and you come, you come on an image, you know, it's, un, it's, it's different than searching for something on the internet, you know, you, you're, you're looking for something very, very specific. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I have always understood architecture is not something that starts from scratch or this, you know, some inspiration comes down from, from the sky, but you, you think about what other architects have done in similar situations. You, I mean, again, you situate your work in relationship to your peers and to your predecessors, and you're in conversation with your peers and your predecessors. And for me, most of that information about what my peers and my predecessors have done, I, I find in books or journals, you know? I mean, I, I mean, look, you know, a lot of it is online today too, you know, I may get information, you know, from Instagram as well, but, you know, when it really comes to, to digging down and looking carefully at something, you, you go to the printed source. It's interesting to be able to talk about the importance of making books because it is a different practice than architecture. Um, and we could talk maybe a little bit about that, the kind of venturing into working methods around that. That, that could be one, you know, sort of shared conversation around that because it's also about a kind of collaborative practice in a way, which architecture is also, in my view, and I think for my generation, very collaborative. We've moved away from the kind of singular figure um, leading everything, but more in collaboration. And so the book and its, its um, as a way of, of, both a way of working and the kind of working methods, but also a pathway, as you said already, to the past, but then to the future. I think is also something that, for me, has always been in your books, um, you know, very, um, very enticing and exciting. And to think about when you're making a book, it's not, it's not something that's just documenting past work, but thinking about and opening up new possibilities. Sure. No, I think I think that's really important to say. I mean, the, the just you know the way in which making a book parallels the process of, of making a building. It's you know there are a lot of factors involved. Uh, I think we've 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 worked with some of the same graphic designers. You've done a couple of books with Alice Chung on Om Omnivore, right? So, you know, and the and the, the dialogue with the with the graphic designer is important. And and I I probably should have credited the other one, which is which is Luke Bowman of of Thumb. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, uh, you know, uh, creative publishers too. I mean, Lars Mueller, again, I would, would point out as somebody who just, who really cares deeply about the design and the culture of the, of the book. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to work with these people, you know. Um, but it is a dialogue, you know, and like, you know, just like the dialogue you have with the client, the dialogue you have with the contractor, you know, there's always a kind of give and take. And you learn a lot from, the conversations with the publisher, with the graphic designer. I mean, you know, also things that I know nothing about, but you know, when you get down to the, you know, to the level at which you're, you know, you're picking out papers and, you know, how, how are the inks gonna sit on a particular, particular paper? So, um, you know, that's, that's part of the sort of pleasure of the, the process of, of, of doing books. And I, you know, I'm sure you've, you, you guys have spent a lot of time and effort, you know, thinking about those, those kinds of issues and, and working with those kinds of issues. So, um, so yeah, I mean, again, that's why I would, I would see it as a kind of parallel practice to, to, to making buildings, another, another collaborative effort that, that also can take, you know, can take a couple of years as well, right? I remember talking with Keller Easterling a long time ago now about that, and, you know, she's sort of advocating that actually books can take longer than, than buildings. Uh, in some case, so I mean, we, we could maybe debate, yes. <laughs> debate that potentially. Yes, right. But there, I mean, there are obviously right. different skills. But it's a it's a lot of work, um, and uh, I think you know in our media culture today, with things obviously Instagram, but immediate immediacy, right? Everything is there, and so this idea of you know really reminding everyone in some ways the amount of work that goes into you know, goes into making something. And I, and I think particularly as projects and, and particularly books 
um, become something that are opened up to others in the process, which I think for sure you could talk about in relation to landform um, as being something that is, you know, you said it came out of um, a symposium, but that inclusion of others' work and as you're working on something, thinking about future work and, um, you know, that, that there's time both um, in the kind of execution and putting those things together, um, but then also allowing the book to be a space to think about future work, um, whether it's writing or publications or architecture itself, and projects, um, is something that we've been thinking a lot about and have tried to do in our, yeah. our projects. Um, and, and you've been very generous in writing for some of those works um, and about also just making space to talk about architecture at large, whether or not it's about you know, either of our projects, but um, to really try to have uh, new and a variety of voices included in, in the work, I think. No, that's true, and, and, and um, I mean, I think there's a way in which, I mean, I like the way you talk about the, the book as a kind of anticipation of future work, you know, that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a chance to try out ideas and formulate things in a certain way, and, you know, and I think particularly in your books, the, the um, you know the, the 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 drawing techniques that you've developed that are then get played out in the in the publications. Um, you know, I think they are a way. They they have a kind of anticipatory quality. You know, they're they're sort of mapping out um, trajectories for for future work. So you know, again, there. I mean, not not to force the issue, but but you know, the, I think both buildings. You know, again, I think buildings hopefully anticipate the life that takes place in them in some future time. Right and. Um, so, yeah, and I, I don't know, I mean, we could, we could talk a little bit maybe about, you know, who are the audience for books, but, you know, I mean, I do also think that in large part, when I'm writing, I think I'm very much thinking of my students, uh, my students and my peers, I would say, you know. Um, so, you know, hopefully something in those books could also plant a seed that, you know, may, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, germinate some, at some point in the future there. Questions, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that too is about how architecture can become more accessible mm -hmm. um, through mm -hmm. what it is that we do. Um, because at least I find uh, in the U.S., uh, maybe more so for sure than in Europe, there is a, a, it's a much more challenged environment for really understanding the scope and role of the architect and maybe we've lost some of our ability as a potentially kind of public figure or, but as teachers and educators, um, I think we have that responsibility to, um, you know, uh, be able to share architecture in a, in a easier sort of way, mm -hmm. um, perhaps than in, in past ways. But I, you know, I want to be careful. I don't want to make it sound as though it's sort of dumbing down <laughs> what it is we do because architecture is complex um, and it does intersect with history and theory and we have to think about how we can, you know, we can kind of navigate these different fields in a way or um, terrains. And um, but the the yeah. book is a, a book is a place that you can bring all of those things together. No, it's true. And and I, you know, I think the other thing is, I mean, again, uh, you know, I've said I'm invested in the culture of the book and the physicality of the book. But, you know, I, which is not, I mean, I think, you know, the. <laughs> When a new technology comes along, it doesn't erase the older technologies. It supplements and overlays on those old technologies. So, you know, there's no reason the, the book, you know, I mean, it's, we're, it's nice we're sort of lecturing in a library here, by the way. You know, we are, in fact, surrounded by books. But, um, um, you know, I, I, but I think books and digital culture can happily live together, you know. Um, it's, it, it's really that it, 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 it sort of opens up and enhances things more than one technology re replacing one another. I mean, I, you know, I will be honest. I mean, there are times I sort of, you know, need to sort of push the students into the library to look at something in a, in a physical book rather than looking it up online. But, um, but you know, there's, there's, a, I, there's a lot of receptiveness to that. And, and um, you know, I, 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 as I said, I, I think the, the, the book and digital culture can they can get along. They can survive together, I think. Yeah, for sure. I think so. I mean, and, and to also maybe expand that to the idea of the archive, and I've spent a lot of time looking at architects' work and drawings, and um, so this idea of yeah. pushing you know, students to sort of not, it's not just about looking at even in books, but I mean, I, 
I, you know, I'm lucky to teach at Columbia and have Avery yeah, Library, exactly, yeah. um, and I've spent time at the CCA in Montreal, and to really sit with certain architects' work and their sketchbooks and their, um, and then their writings at the same time. So this is also for me, it's a, archive is a kind of book-like, and um, you know, the, it produces new tempos maybe in the way that we think about our work. So I don't know if you want to open it up. Thank you very much. I think that we can open up to, the, to discussion and involving someone from the public. Quindi se volete fare delle domande, insomma, siete liberi di farle perché ancora abbiamo un po' di tempo. I, I, um, if I can, I'm just uh, very yeah, yeah. interested to, yeah, to yeah, yeah, I mean, to ask you some question about drawings because it, it's, a, it's a very interesting discussion about uh, how an author can uh, write about it himself, so how he, he can make, or he made also a criticism. But uh, I'm also interested in, in, uh, in your drawing uh, as a way of express your project and if you change your mind uh, in, in, in the way in which drawing express your projects from the land, landform buildings, for example, until the situated objects. Because I, I saw this particular drawing that you use not to open and uh, make uh, buildings uh, so uh, readable, no? Mm -hmm. I think that there is a willingness to, to express the, the, the building, how they are from inside also. Sure. Um, I mean, I don't, you know, not, not to get too much into the, the sort of mechanics of it, but um, in some sense, I, I mean, you know, the many reasons why I moved from working at the sort of larger urban scale to the smaller sort of domestic scale, um, uh, you know, one of them is I got tired of 19-hour plane flights to, to Asia, <laughs> but, uh, and also, I mean, you know, the, the, the large-scale urban work always has to happen with a big collaborative team, you know, and you're, you're dealing with, you know, public agencies and financing and all of these very, very complex issues. So, um, but part of it at, at, at one level was simply that I could be involved drawing the projects when we're dealing with the scale of something like a house or an artist's studio, you know? Um, and, you know, that was part of my formation, and I think the ability to, to draw and to make drawing part of the process was, was actually quite, quite important. So that's another reason why, why drawings figure so, uh, so prominently in the Situated Objects book. And, and, you know, again, it's a sort of reflection of the, the climate of, 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 I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, how many architects today actually draw day to day, right? I mean, I know you guys do, um, but, you know, the, 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 the technologies of, of practice have, yeah, no, no, it's just, I mean, the simple answer is that, that um, that shift to the smaller scale had to do with being able to, to sort of recuperate the agency of the drawing. In, in the practice, absolutely, yeah. Allora, non so se c'è qualcuno dal pubblico che ha altre domande, però forse, non lo so, vedo che in platea abbiamo anche Franco Purini, magari, non lo so, se, se vogliamo aprire una discussione anche sul tema del disegno come strumento critico, non so se qualcuno vuole, o qualcuno vuole fare, insomma, altre domande. Thank you for the beautiful presentation and for the conversation. Um, well, my question is in regard exactly to the critical drawing um, and in regard to, of course, your presentation and the theme of situated objects and uh, field condition. Um, I cannot help but connect these, uh, these themes to one of your studies, uh, your drawings of Campo Marzio's Piranesi from the 70s and the 80s. Uh, in which you basically took and isolated the objects from the field and uh, you entered this critical conversation with the past. So I was wondering if we can maybe continue on this theme, of course in the time that we have, uh, about your way of critically analyzing the past and making the history some kind of operative and applying maybe the same type of analysis in understanding history and also in practicing architecture. 
and maybe even this conversation can be regarded to the drawing because you use, of course, this same type of representation, which is axonometry, and even for Piranesi's Campo Marzio and for your projects. So maybe, thank you. No, sure, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, and I mean, that work was done in the mid 1980s, not, not quite the 70s, but um, so certainly at a time when I was, was closer to my experience with Cooper Union and, and, and of course the origin of the 90 degree projection is with, with John Haydick at the, at the Cooper Union. Um, but no, I think it, 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 it also speaks to the, the way in which, um, uh, you know, drawings can be used to develop and open up starting from a kind of, a kind of um, starting point that, that may be a particular project in the present or it may be a, a piece, you know, again, it's this idea of a kind of conversation with the, with the past. And of course, I mean, the choice of, of the Piranesi Campo Marzio was, I mean, it was, that actually predated the field conditions, but of course the Campo is a field, so, and, you know, the, even I would say, the, I mean, the, 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 the particularly the large plan of the Campo Marzio, incredibly high degree of specificity to the individual parts, but then there are, you know, there's a kind of almost a, a, a kind of profusion of parts such that you can no longer identify the individual parts, right? Um, so it, if, if nothing else, it speaks to a, a long-term fascination with that tension between the specificity of the individual piece um, and the kind of larger field in which in which which they exist, and and you're absolutely correct to say that the many of the drawing techniques are are exactly the same, um, and you know the idea that the drawing can be used to explicate, but also to you know particularly the section right the section cuts, and when you cut a section you 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 expose uh, the interior and you expose construction. And you, you can deal with the questions of the interior and with structure and, 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 and so on. So, um, you know, to, to the degree that any kind of critical operation is a kind of cr cutting and un, un opening up, um, you know, there, there is a kind of consistency there. So, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My question is, uh, um, is about the first slides that you have showed. Okay, I was very interested in uh, the slides that you have shown, uh, the series of books uh, that from my point of view, from what, I've, uh, from what I have un understood, is that those are the series of books that uh, have uh, conditioned the discipline of architecture. Okay, uh, my question is extremely simple. I'm, I'm very curious to know why uh, delirious New York was set on a different slide than architecture of the city. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, w w and the way you have shown these slides, it also shows your way of not explaining the, the architectural discipline, but uh, how do you see things, your vision of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm very sure that when an architect, how he relates to those books, it will affect the way that he designed projects, and how he even thematized his book in his personal library without even having to explain it to anyone. So this is a part of curiosity. So uh, this is one. Another thing, uh, can I ask another question also? Is it possible, do we have enough time? Yeah, what do you think about the climate of today where everyone is publishing anything? So it's easier today. It's yeah, question. anyone is publishing anything. Everyone's good. All of us are winners, and the discipline doesn't exist anymore. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I. Uh, I mean, we, as to your second question, I. I kind of agree with you. I, I'm not quite sure if I have anything more to add to it, but it's a. It is. Yeah. I mean, I. You know, when I was dean, I would, these books would arrive. And, you know, because they. You know, the, the, people send their books to a dean. You know, and I. People I met didn't know and never heard of, and their monograph arrives at my desk. You know, so that's a slightly different question. I mean, it's and and you know, I mean, again, it it um, the nature of the publishing industry. I mean, that's a that's it is a it's a it's a topic worth discussing. But um, but but you you know, look, I mean, what. This is what this is.
prices. Well, it, it, it devalues the book. You're, you know, no, no, you're, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct, yeah. Um, but, I mean, to, to go to your first question, I mean, I mean, partly, look, that's a very personal, and, and again, I'm not a historian. I don't, you know, make a kind of comprehensive lecture about the, the role of the book and the treatise in architecture. You know, that, that would, you could make a seminar out of that, a very important seminar. But um, I suppose the, um, you know, the, 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 the idea that, it, it, certainly in the United States, complexity and contradiction, Vincent Scully said it in his introduction, is an answer to Verzun Architektur. Um, and uh, then, of course, Architecture of the City was published in Italian in 1966, the same year as Complexity and Contradiction. And it really speaks to Europe and, and the United States in different ways, reevaluating the, 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 the city, the, 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 the uh, the ordinary collective production of architecture, but through really very different lenses, Rossi and, 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 and Venturi. So, so it's partly just simply the, 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 the coincidence of they're both coming out in, in 66. I, I, the, and now, curiously enough, uh, Architecture of the City was translated by the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies and actually came out probably right around the same time as um, Delirious New York in English. Exactly, exactly. No, no, absolutely. And, and um, so, you know, I mean, again, the English language reception of Rossi, you know, these are, these are com complicated questions and so on. But, um, but really for me, it was really more the sort of generational shift to, to Shumi and Kohlhaus, um, who are architects who made practices, both Shumi and Kohlhaus, essentially constructed a practice around architectural competitions and books. Um, and so uh, the presence, also Manhattan Transcripts and Delirious New York, both talking about, about New York, um, that you know, established them as presences in the field, um, as in important figures in the field, um, but before they were really recognizable as, as building ar architects, really. That, that, was, that was more what was intended by that. I mean, I, you know, I could have included any one of the many books by Peter Eisenman in that, you know. But once you start, there are there are many. But um, but but yeah, it's it, it's no, it's true that the 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 architecture of the city was 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 translated and published by the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies, where where Peter Eisenman was the director. And um, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was right around that same time, around late 1970s. So, yeah. Bene, se, se non ci sono altre domande allora possiamo chiudere. Grazie mille, grazie a Stan, grazie a Vitali.